Thank you very much for the introduction uh, and, uh, and good afternoon to, um, to all of you. Um, a great thanks uh, to ERA for the opportunity to present uh, a practical insight uh, into the data protection impact assessment concept. You will hear me uh, abbreviating the term to DPIA or D, uh, DPIA. So uh, there are several acronyms used uh, such as PIA, Privacy Impact Assessment. This is actually the acronym that used uh, to be quite a lot employed in the US and uh, Canada. So uh, countries, as mentioned, that uh, were the pioneers of this uh, concept uh, and the implementation of DPS before, before uh, the process has been introduced to Europe. So, um, as said uh, and promised a practical insight, uh, I, I will uh, really bypass uh, the theoretical explanations about what the DPA is about, trying a little bit to point out what I see as the most uh, um, important for uh, you uh, to uh, retain from this session today. Um, some practical steps about uh, how to design a data protection impact assessment, probably this is uh, um, a need in your organization too. So checklists, are you going to find back in this presentation now uh, the checklists? Uh, probably not, uh, given there are examples, but I'll explain why I don't see the place of checklists in this type of, uh, of uh, discussions here. Um, and then uh, um, I will end with some uh, conclusions. Um, yes, uh, the presentation will be um, will be distributed, so um, it will be available on the site, uh, I believe, correct? So you will not find it now in the folder, but uh, of course I'm happy to answer questions and you will have it afterwards available online. Um, about the concept to refresh memories, uh, yes, we're sticking to uh, GDPR here, the regulation. Uh, just uh, to say, because I see, I notice that there are some EU officials here that uh, in the new regulation on personal data protection, 17 and 25 of the European institutions, so the regulatory act which uh, really um, um, now sets out the framework of protection of personal data when these are employed, are used, are processed by the European institutions and agencies, so this regulation also stipulates now the obligation of the conduct of DPS. So having these two regulations in mind, first uh, I think to note is that there is no definition of the DPA given in any of the text. In the GDPR it is set out as an obligation on the data controller and when does this obligation start? When uh, we are, as a company and organization, in the process of introducing a type of processing, and in particular, a new technology, for instance, a new application, a CRM system, an SAP tool, um, a new, um, a, a, a new uh, operation or set of operations, that may have a, a, a high, they may entail a high risk and may, for this reason, have an impact on the uh, rights and freedoms of the data subjects. So in this case, uh, it is uh, an obligation for the data controller to conduct uh, the DPA. In, uh, Guidelines that followed uh, the regulation, uh, for instance, uh, uh, in the CNIL guideline, uh, we have a, a quite more sharp uh, definition of the DPA where it is characterized uh, as a process designed to, to describe the processing, to assess uh, the necessity and proportionality of a processing operation, and to help manage the risks. Similar definitions you will find in uh, more or less all the guidelines that are now um, um, at our disposal uh, through our regulatory bodies in your countries. Um, some uh, common denominator uh, uh, functional requirements, common requirements of a DPA based on, this, uh, um, on these rules are the following. 
First of all, um, the DPA is not mandatory in all cases. So this is something that we have to keep in mind. In the very beginning of uh, the entry to force of the regulation, there was a quite big misunderstanding in many organizations that they had really to start developing DPAs for all and every kind of processing activities, which is, of course, a, a huge burden, but also not a necessity in terms of risk. On the other hand, if uh, the processing operation is qualified as of high risk, um, you need to be also careful because uh, already in uh, Article 35 of GDPR, we have the or certain, some indicative cases in which the DPA becomes mandatory. Uh, we heard this morning that uh, national uh, data protection authorities can also enlarge this category. Uh, for instance, when there is a, 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 a processing of sensitive personal data on a larger scale, or when there is a regular and systematic uh, um, monitoring of the behavior of persons, profiling, then these type of operations, yes, are subject uh, to the DPA, uh, but each national authority has the possibility to include other cases in their, um, in their uh, national law. Um, the cases, even if they are drawn up and included in the lists of mandatory DPS of, uh, of the authorities, you need to take into account that these are indicative. It doesn't mean that only those operations are subject to PIA. It is actually to the organizations afterwards uh, through um, a procedure, I'll try to explain afterwards, to understand to what extent probably, yes, the data processing operation that uh, they have, the concern, um, is not really, cannot refer in any of these mandatory cases that are listed in the, uh, in the regulators lists, mandatory lists of DPA, but however, they can be subject to PIA. So um, consider all these mandatory lists of national authorities as really um, indicative. Um, ideally, um, as I said, uh, the, um, uh, the processing operation that uh, um, the DPA has to be carried out before, prior to the introduction of uh, the data processing operation or of the system. This is, of course, the ideal situation. Um, many times we see that uh, at the same time when uh, the, um, the first uh, feasibility study of a project uh, um, fin um, finishes within an organization, at this time uh, they also initiate uh, the data protection impact assessment. Um, it can be applied, the DPA, only on one data processing operation, but it may also uh, be applied on a set of operations. Uh, example, uh, we have, uh, for instance, Infabel or uh, another transportation uh, operator, railway operator, and uh, uh, they decide to deploy the same system of video surveillance in all the railway stations it may not be necessary to really carry out hundreds of DPS, but only concentrate on one representative DPA and have it afterwards um, considered for all the railway stations. So this is an example that is given already in uh, uh, the guideline of the European Data Protection uh, Board. Um, take into account that the scope of the DPA, as well as the number, as I uh, mentioned uh, before, uh, is uh, can be is flexible so um, the DPA many times focuses on one system on one operation in some cases it is possible to um, refer to a relationship that the data controller has with a cloud operator where again um, the service is provided through a core system, one core application. So the scope can be flexible of the DPA. Uh, 
take into account that um, at the end, the DPA is not the one size fits all. There are guidelines, but uh, the regulation underlines, and you will see in practice, that it can be probably the same operation that is deployed in hundreds of data controllers, but in a different way, because not, uh, the setting is not the same, because the context, uh, the business environment is not the same, uh, or because uh, uh, even uh, the, the parties around um, the processing activity are not the same. So it's very difficult to say that there is just one template, follow this strictly, and then this, you are saved now. Uh, unfortunately, this is not the case. Um, if I can go quickly through the phases of a data protection impact assessment, um, you see um, in, uh, um, in the heart of this uh, slide um, that at the end, we need to have a project plan in order to be able to deploy correctly a, a DPA. Um, a project plan, plan that will be able, first of all, to embrace the, um, the stakeholders, the main stakeholders that have to be involved. I'll come back to that uh, in, in some minutes. Facts. So to know, first of all, about what we ask a DPR. Um, we have heard, and I'm sure that many of you privacy specialists as well, you have heard also uh, proposition suggestions from your clients saying that, okay, can you probably issue a DPA for my organization? I mean, no, it, it's not really possible. Normally, the DPA should really be on and relevant to a specific data processing activity within a very specific setting. Um, and then you have, of course, a quite, um, I would say, a detailed evaluation phase that you need to demonstrate. So you need really to document in the DPA. And um, if I can a little bit comment on the wider cycle um, along this, uh, this uh, the, the blue heart there, uh, starting from uh, uh, the very top on uh, my left, description of processing. Um, needless that an organization starts a DPA if they don't know their system. The DPA, on the other hand, so starting this process will help them to understand better the specific processing activity. What type of elements do you need to capture under this description of processing? What is the system about? Uh, what types of data um, um, are we talking about or should, bu should be covered by or covered and affected by the processing activity? Um, are there data flows, very important, uh, flows to which type of organizations, uh, internally only or also external to organizations? And if external to the organizations uh, employing the TPA, are they, for instance, third parties such as pro uh, authorities, regulatory authorities, or other type of parties. I'll come to back, uh, back to that uh, later. Um, once the description is there, then, uh, um, of course, another area to look into is what is the legal basis of your processing? You need to, um, and the DPA actually refers to, has to denote the legal basis. Um, to this, uh, we do not have uh, a, a lot of solutions there. We have uh, really to go through a, a legal analysis, uh, be able to map the processing activities to the legal grounds that are provided in the regulation. We have to check whether legitimate interest uh, uh, could be a basis, and if yes, then this has to be really documented. So we, have, we need to have a justification about what this legitimate interest is and to document it clearly in the DPA. Then another big, big chapter of the DPA, especially because uh, this is pointed out in the article as such, is the proportionality and necessity analysis. Um, it is very um, important to uh, get into this exercise through the PIA and ask the question to the stakeholders, so to the persons who are going to use a system, the persons who are going to use the data affected by the processing to say, okay, 
Could the purpose probably be satisfied by other means, uh, by probably another set of controls or that, that can be in place? So proportionality and necessity, and even to ask the question, is this type of processing operation as is made through the tool really necessary? For instance, uh, is it really necessary to go through a regular day after day monitoring of our employees, how do you, do you justify this in your DPA? These are questions that uh, should be found, so we need to, to indicate these questions in, in the DPA, but also answer those. Um, legal analysis, that's very important, and this is one of the reasons why the checklist cannot work, at least not to 100%. It's not just the conditions, uh, requirements of the regulation of the GDPR uh, or of the EU regulation that you will have in the DPA. The legal analysis will take into account e even the sectoral law, starting, let's say, that we have now to uh, perform a DPA in Belgium, you will take into account the GDPR. Immediately after that, there are some provisions of the implemented decree of the GDPR in Belgium, so you need to take this legal act into account. Then uh, there is sectorial law. Um, it can be healthcare law, it can be telecommunications law, it can be media law, many, many other rules that at the end uh, may have to also be included, encompassed in the scope of the DPA. So we have to look at those. Why is this important? Because based on these requirements, we will, have, we will identify threat scenarios that are specific to the operation. Um, if we talk, and you have seen probably, some DPAs and guidelines that have been issued even before the GDPR, for instance, on smart meters. Uh, this is a very specific, as you know, in the ne energy sector, a very specific application uh, um, through which uh, your consumption is going to be calculated, but uh, through systems that are, at the end uh, will analyze data about even your daily consumption, but taking into account your habits in uh, the... Um, in the, um, uh, in, uh, the, the habits uh, in the household. And at the end, they derive in the processing of personal information. If you follow the smart grid uh, questions of the DPA, for a DPA that you are going to do in the banking sector, you can understand that the threat scenarios are very different. Um, and this uh, goes to the, the, the layer uh, we have after that, the risk analysis and assessment in order to be able to identify, analyze uh, the risk, you have really to be able to think about uh, cases, it can be hypothetical cases, realistic or highly likely to, pro be pro to, to, uh, to happen, cases where there, that there is, that finally reveal a risk for uh, the data subject. Um, and this is, so the design of the risk scenarios or threat scenarios is, I believe, the most, uh, difficult, the most difficult part of the data protection impact assessment. Uh, once uh, you are there and you have identified some scenarios, of course, um, you need to assess the risk. Exactly uh, what I mentioned before, to say to what extent the, the risk stays hypothetical. If the risk stays hypothetical, this means that at the end you will have a DPA with uh, a very, very low rating. I will explain uh, even in the follow-up slides. If the risk is quite realistic, this means that probably the threat is very serious, and this at the end may lead to a negative DPA, so a DPA that will reveal a high risk. Um, once uh, the risk analysis is done, then uh, you have to check the measures that you have uh, internally currently in the organization. Uh, and this is what we call the rating of the current risk. So at the end, 
the DPIA will also include description about the technological measures, the safeguards, the policies, the procedures, the documentation you have in place, and basically um, any kind of measures that can help diminish the risk at the current situation, as, as it is currently the situation in the company. The remediation plan, it's really another important piece of the DPA because at the end this is why you, uh, you, you are getting into this exercise in order to um, understand and identify at the end um, remediation activities, so mitigation activities that will help you to address, to address, sorry, to address uh, efficiently the risk, to diminish the risk if possible. Um, designing a DPA in practice, um, I can tell you that this is probably the day after scenario, after the entry to force of the GDPR. Um, luckily, the DPA was not the case of the privacy or data protection by design where still there are many questions uh, of organizations about what the concept is about and how can I implement it in practice. Um, we saw companies uh, that I could uh, uh, probably compare to this small man running with the phone around trying to call either the authority or stakeholders other uh, services in his organization to find out what he had to do. But I can say that in the DPA case we were a little bit luckier in the sense that there were, there were already some good paradigms uh, examples from authorities with very practical advice on how you have to conduct a PIA, especially privacy impact assessment at that time. For instance, the UK uh, regulator, the CNIL as well, if not the Canadian authority, they had examples even well before the GDPR. And uh, um, this means, uh, and at the end, businesses were a bit prepared, uh, prepared to, to get into this exercise. Where the, um, the panic uh, um, was still uh, uh, quite, I would say, obvious, um, even uh, uh, the 26th of May, Okay, the DPA is there, more or less, we have the tools to make it in our organization, but which are the processes exactly we need to focus on? This was the point of uncertainty with the, with the organizations, and this is why most of them, they started, as I said, this mass of DPIA examinations. They started just repeating the DPA exercise in all systems without any approach, which is exactly, um, which was exactly the, the missing piece. So the piece that uh, uh, they couldn't find there is um, how to make and organize my DPA project that at the end uh, tra is translating a, a DPA strategy. Um, it is not so, uh, difficult at the end if we follow a helicopter view and if we take into account three basic, three basic, um, three basic uh, phases. First phase is uh, the threshold uh, assessment. Um, already by um, having a set of questions that uh, um, uh, at the end uh, will help you identify which are the processes and activities being really uh, of high risk because these are activities or these are processes and operations that are included in the mandatory list of the DPS. Um, by making this threshold stage and uh, conducting this, uh, you can, uh, I would say, eliminate some of the cases of having of where or no, uh, of whether or not I need to go to a DPA, to, to a more detailed analysis. So the threshold assessment is the first stage. The second stage is really once you know at the end that yes, I went through the threshold questions, but it seems that then there is a high risk and I need to get deeper into the, into the, um, into the, the assessment and uh, the measuring of the risk. Uh, 
you have uh, the core of the DPA that I would characterize, cal qualify as a DPA analysis. And uh, then uh, uh, when you are at this stage, you have to look around and find other um, tools within the organization that will help you facilitate the task, the DPA conduct, uh, which can be leveraging from uh, existing uh, tools that you have already started, for example, the, um, uh, the ROPAS, other privacy compliance assessments, maturity assessments. Why? Because many of the questions that you are going to ask afterwards to the stakeholders in order to understand how they process the data are really questions that you have probably already asked during a maturity assessment exercise within your company. Um, and now, of course, it is the question of how to format the DPA. Um, quite uh, for the moment, uh, uh, we are used to working a lot still with Excel documents. Probably it is the case with the organizations where you're working with. Um, there are, however, also automated tools that may help in the systematization of DPS and building a strategy. So organize your DPA project. Uh, it's, uh, it's really very important, especially in order to organize yourselves through these practical steps. You see that the slide encompasses the phases from planning to scope up to remediation. Um, there is also one very important stage, maintenance of the DPA that you will not find there because uh, um, I didn't want really to, um, to put all the details on the same slide, uh, but just giving you this helicopter view. All these uh, one to eight steps uh, show to you practically, not really getting into the phases as it was in the previous slide, but really practically showing to you what has to intervene to be done when. Um, for example, plan and scope in your project, the scope of the DPA, um, which are the stakeholders I'm going to invite in order to participate in this exercise. Uh, what is the role of the DPO? This is, uh, these are activities that you have to organize in this stage, planning and scoping. Um, design the methodology. There are plenty of methodologies in your organization, but also external to organizations, because they are provided by the authorities, by regulators. Uh, we saw even the guideline uh, um, uh, previously about accountability of the ground of the European Data Protection Supervisor, very good guidance already. So uh, methodologies are there, but you need still to leverage them. and to customize them in the probably methodology that your audit department or risk department is using. Uh, engage with the stakeholders, another uh, big, of course, uh, um, step. Um, the description of facts in the DPA, the definition of requirements, uh, quantify and risk rating, these are also um, things uh, that uh, uh, take time. Uh, you need some sharp thinking, but uh, um, at the end, uh, again, there are good examples uh, and um, uh, matrices I will show you that uh, can be useful. The definition of remediation uh, at the end after a DPA, you may have a lot of remediation activities. Um, what we recommend many times is uh, to follow the clustering approach, meaning to try to really uh, provide sets or make up sets of recommendations, for instance, a cluster relating to data subjects' rights, which will encompass all the activities that you have to do in order to enhance your, uh, your transparency to data subjects or to facilitate the way you reply to their requests. Um, threshold questions. So uh, for the first stage I explained, these are questions that we will help you identify to what extent you need or not to get into the more in-depth analysis. I leave it up to you to read. Um, indicative questions that you will have to, um, to follow during the legal analysis. Here is exactly what uh, you see as the difference between questions that are given and work in all cases and questions that have to be tailored. Um, and the tailoring is missing from these questions. And it is, why? Because it is the purpose to have each data controller um, feel accountable and also knowing better the environment uh, 
get into the exercise to, to, to prepare the more specific questions. So the stakeholders will need to be involved. Here you see five scales uh, from the management to external stakeholders. Uh, certainly a, a line you have to take into account and to evolve uh, is uh, the management. Uh, important because they give the go for the DPS, but they also release budgets afterwards for uh, the execution of the remediation plan. External, ex external stakeholders as well. I mean, we talk about the obligation um, to make a DPA for data controllers, but many, many times the, the real execution of the processing activity is done by the processor. So uh, he has to be involved as well. Um, uh, yeah, so an example of risk rating and uh, I believe that the conclusions, uh, the big conclusion or uh, um, recommendation from uh, practitioners as me to different organizations we, we, uh, we um, uh, work with uh, on DPS is just not looking at it as a, an obligation, a pure obligation, but try to turn it to an advantage, a business av advantage for you and a compliance enabler in the sense that, uh, uh, first of all, if you are organized uh, the DPA correctly, it can serve for you as a very, very nice, valuable tool to manage your data and even uh, to document appropriately the risks. Uh, so it is certainly uh, an added value. A DPA is certainly an added value to your uh, organization internally, but also to external players and more importantly, the regulator to show that uh, you have identified risks and you can manage them. So that's it. And um, I'm here for more questions if necessary. Okay.